Good morning, Herman Baptist. I'm so glad you could join me. Um, I'm just uh, excited to begin our study in uh, 1 Peter. Uh, we're going to do 1 and 2 Peter, but we're going to start with 1 Peter. Uh, just to kind of give you a, a little bit of, of, of warning, just in case you get concerned with uh, Pastor Dowdy's uh, hygiene. Uh, I will be recording uh, several of these videos at once. I'm going to try and shoot for a chapter each time I record. So if I don't change my clothes, that's probably because I'm, all, I'm doing this all on the same day. So don't be too concerned. I am making sure that I'm following proper hygiene. But today we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I'm glad you can join us here for day 1. Um, for, so uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 1 and 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I want to stop right there before we keep going on. Peter, uh, who was Peter? Well, Peter was, I, I think for, for all of us, we can very much understand who Peter was. We, we relate very well to Peter. Uh, Peter was the, the leader of the disciples. He was the leader of the twelve. He's very well known. Uh, most of, of the, the inter, interactions with Jesus and his disciples, you see Peter in and out of here. And I personally relate very well to Peter simply because uh, Peter is just the one disciple that tends to put his foot in his mouth more than any other disciple. I kind of relate well to that because I tend to do that myself quite often. I tell people uh, very frequently, I know the size of my mouth, it's about a size 10. Uh, just simply because I know, I know what it's like to say something that I shouldn't have said to uh, speak without thinking. Peter is very much that type of person. So what we're looking at here is not only was Peter a, uh, the, the leader of the, the 12, but uh, in this portion of history, Peter is one of the leaders in the early church. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, in Galatia, in Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You look at this, and it's very interesting to, to see who he's writing to. He's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion. He's writing to, to Christians who are spread out through the world at this time. It's a very unique time in history, and in fact, if you go into history, a lot's written about this uh, uh, in particular and this group of people that uh, Peter is writing to. At this point in time in history... Uh, the emperor of Rome is Nero, and uh, Nero was uh, known not only for being a vicious and cruel emperor, but he was also known for his insatiable desire to build, to uh, create greatness for himself, and a lot of that was done through architecture and civic programs. Um, in particular, Nero himself wanted to build this uh, grand palace. He wanted to be able to uh, create these buildings to his own legacy. The problem was, in Rome at the time, uh, most of the real estate was filled. There wasn't really any real estate for him to build on. So, according to many of the historians of the day, uh, Nero actually set the fires uh, for this great fire in Rome, and it really burned down uh, a good portion of the city. And at this point in history, you've got a, a, a bunch of Romans who have seen not only their city destroyed, but they've seen their temples destroyed, their places of worship completely wiped out, plus their homes, and in their, each one of their homes, usually they had some... Um, uh, family idols. So in this moment, not only was their their physical world shaken up, but so was their spiritual world because they looked at this situation, this great fire in Rome, as being something that even their gods couldn't protect them from. And a lot of rumor and speculation went out that this was Nero doing this. So Nero, in his uh, in in what he would have considered his wisdom, he decided to find a scapegoat for his plans to burn the city of Rome so he could build again. And his scapegoat was the Christians. See, Christians were already hated. They were linked in with the Jews, and they were considered a, 
a, an offshoot, a sect of the Jews, and they were seen as people who were uh, against Romans, typical Roman society. So in this moment, Peter is writing to people who were facing deep and, and, and uh, intense persecution. This is a huge time of trouble in the lives of many Christians as we read what Peter is writing here in 1 Peter chapter 1. And he writes to, in verse 2, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. I don't want to get into this idea of uh, predestination and, and all of that, but what I do want to focus on when, when Peter says the elect, um, we, we look at how God chooses each and every one of us. It's hard for us to wrap our, our minds around the idea that God chose us for salvation. It's, it's really uh, difficult for us to, to um, just reconcile that. Why did we deserve it? Well, the fact of the matter is we didn't, but God chose us. Well, the interesting thing here is that Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are facing this uh, just intense persecution, and he calls them the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. In other words, they are the chosen ones of God. According to all that God knew, they were the ones that God chose to live in this time. And it's very, very interesting for us, especially in our current situation with the, the, the coronavirus going around. We, we are uh, just wondering why things are going on. We're, we're in confusion. It, it almost seems uh, to us like uh, uh, just things are out of control. And yet, we can put ourselves right in the same position that Peter is putting, uh, he's describing all of these Christians who are cast out of, of Rome and, and, and facing intense persecution, we can put ourselves in the same position. We, we say, well, why do we have to face these trials and troubles of our world? Because God chose us as believers to live in this time and to deal with these circumstances. It wasn't something that God... Uh, misplaced in his mind. This isn't something that slipped through the cracks. You are not somebody who was ill-equipped to face this situation. God specifically chose you and I to face this time for a reason. We are here to face uh, this virus. We're here to face all of the challenges that we're, we're about to face in the next couple of weeks, months, and maybe even years. But we are here to do it so that we can spread the gospel throughout the world. I want us also to notice as we look in, in verse 2, uh, the, the uh, stressing on the, the Trinity itself. He says in verse 2, he says, uh, elect to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So we're looking at God the Father. In the sanctification of the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. For the obedience and sprinkling of, uh, of the blood of Jesus Christ, so God the Son. So you have God the Father, God the uh, Holy Spirit, and God the Son. You've got the Trinity just mentioned right here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. But I also want to kind of back up the truck here and look at the phrase sprinkling of the blood. He, he is referring to Scripture here, and he's referring to the allusions that... <coughs> In the Old Testament, the Old Testament sacrifices, you go into the Day of Atonement and they would sacrifice the lamb and then they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy, on the, the, in the Holy of Holies, on, on the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant there, and it would just be that one time of year for the covering of sins. And it was an incomplete sacrifice. As much as they could make it uh, spotless and holy, it still wasn't a totally perfect sacrifice. It didn't do everything that we needed it to do. But when we have the sprinkling of blood, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, we have that perfect sacrifice. It's a once-for-all sacrifice. For those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, for those of us who have believed that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, 
His blood was sprinkled so that our sins could be cleansed. And not just once, and not just something that we'd have to do continually, but once for all. It was taken care of. And what does that sprinkling, what does that forgiveness do for us? We'll look at the end of verse 2. It says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. What forgiveness does for us, what salvation does for us, is it provides us with the grace of God, that unmerited favor that God gives us. And it gives us peace. Not just a little bit, but it says, be multiplied. In excess, we are given grace and peace in excess because God not only gives us what we ask for, but he gives us above and beyond all that we can ask or think. These are the things that God gives us today. So remember, you have been chosen to live in this time. God chose you specifically. Even though we're facing times of trouble, even though we're living in a world of, of fear and confusion, God chose you to live for right now so that you could share grace and peace with other people. I hope you enjoyed today. We're going to come back tomorrow. Uh, we're going to keep these videos relatively short so that uh, uh, we could just dive into the word every day. I want you to also remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. I hope you enjoyed today. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.